Uh, wait, is Will supposed to be judging us wrong? I have Rohan as the No. Uh, I do not know where where Rohan is. Rohan, are you here? Okay, cool. I will ask for him. Okay. Yeah, because I saw him. There's only like four emails in the chat, so I guess something's missing. So right now we're just waiting for Rohan? I think so. OK, sounds good. Also, I'm unsure about this, but I'm pretty sure y'all are not supposed to put your names. Like, if you are competing, you're just supposed to put, like, Nick first speaker. So if y'all have your names, then make sure to take those out. Rohan's here. Oh, Rohan, can you put your email in for the chain? Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, I just sent it. Just let me know when everyone gets it. I got it. Me too. Give me one sec. My Wi-Fi has been a little bit slow. Before we begin, our case does briefly discuss undocumented immigration. If you would rather we not read this, you can text me anonymously at 612-760-8793, and we'd be happy to read a different affirmative. Can you just drop that in the chat, your number? Wait, who's what side? And um, 
Oh, you have it on the thing? Okay. Wait, who's speaking first? Uh, the, the app is speaking first. Oh, okay. Is everyone ready to begin? Graham and I affirm, first an observation, the harms to the drug in innovation in a world with Medicare for all are overstated. This is for two reasons. First, drug prices are elastic as Gorman 14 finds sales volume appears to increase substantially following the usual assumptions regarding negative relationship between prices and quality demand. The average increase in total revenue was 57%. Secondly, reduced profits for drug companies have a minimal effect on investment in research as Kogan and Ho of 16 find the drug industry spends 1.3% of its budget on research. Innovation is driven by independent investigators will continue to conduct research even if drug prices fall. With that, our sole contention is access. The status quo is bleak for healthcare in America. It's Golvan et al. 2020 funds, although healthcare expenditures per capita is higher in the USA than in any other country, more than 37 million Americans do not have health insurance and 41 million more do have inadequate access to care. This has negative effects on patients. As Garfield 19 finds, uninsured people are far more likely to postpone healthcare or forego it altogether. The consequences can be severe, particularly when preventable con conditions or chronic diseases go undetected. Adults are uninsured over three times more likely to not have visited a doctor in the past 12 months. Even doctors are ready for a change. As Paris 18 finds, if single pair cost doctors so much, why do the majority prefer it? Private insurers make us jump through bureaucratic hoops to secure payments. Claims are routinely denied. Doctors personally spend nine hours a week on billing and administration. Doctors do better under Medicare for All because with less paperwork, they have more time to see doctors and make money. As Narayan 19 finds, under Medicare for All, physicians wouldn't exhaust their time with administrative duties and would have newly available time to see more patients. Overall, they would get paid more. Critically, countries with single-payer systems do not see worse wait times compared to the U.S. As well drop 19 funds, data from other nations show that universal coverage does not result in substantially longer wait times. In fact, the United States' peer nations have shorter wait times. Across 10 European countries, the United States performed worse than nations with universal coverage. Medicare for All is the solution to the problem. As the standard Medicare for All Act of 2019 says, every individual who is a resident of the United States or in the United States has access to health care. The standard would be high for patients. As Cliff and Scott 19 find, both single-payer options envision Medicare covering more benefits than it currently does. The Sanders bill would change Medicare to cover vision, dental prescription drugs, as well as long-term care services. It would also cover women's reproductive health services, including abortion. Hospitals are also better off with Medicare for All. As Kai and Con 19 indicate, the House bill would abandon any per-patient payments and instead fund hospitals through global budgets. The Senate bill also calls for global budgeting for hospitals. Under global budgeting, hospitals receive an annual lump sum. Under the system, hospitals receive extra funding in the case of unexpected deficits. Even with global budgeting, the system would still be cheaper. The Kai et al. 20 meta-analysis funds, the median funding was a net savings of 3.5% system costs, and now Analysis of the 19 out of 22 plans found net savings. All studies estimate lower savings due to simplified payment administration. There are two impacts. The first is saving lives. It's Golvani et al. 2020 funds. Ensuring healthcare access for all Americans would save more than 68,000 lives and 73 million life years each year compared to the status quo. The second is immigrants. As Samara et al. 19 find, more than 11.3 million undocumented people currently reside throughout the United States. Unfortunately, Adrika et al. 19 continues that 45% of undocumented immigrants were uninsured, compared to less than 1 in 10 citizens as of 2017. Given their high uninsurance rate, many undocumented immigrants delay or go without needed care. The struggles of undocumented people aren't limited to healthcare alone. As Samara et al. 19 find, undocumented individuals have a high rate of structural vulnerability and are more likely to live below the federal poverty level, 56 versus 32%, also compared to documented immigrants. More undocumented immigrants have not completed high school. 52 versus 43 percent, and have poor English literacy, 75 versus 53 percent. Fortunately, Medicare for All provides health insurance and coverage to everyone in the U.S., including undocumented immigrants. Insurance has major positive effects. As Wilper 19 funds, the uninsured were more likely to die 40 percent of the time than those with insurance. For these reasons, we affirm. <laughs> Is everyone ready? Yeah? Okay. We negate. Our first contention is elections. Joe Biden is on the track to winning the election as Jacobs reports last week that for the first time he has more than 270 electoral votes in his favor. 
Unfortunately, affirming the reverse is as Shoal 20 quantifies it because of COVID-19, 69% of voters support Medicare for all. There are two reasons affirming to get Trump re-elected, and the first is taking credit. Trump takes credit for other people's policies. For example, Che 20 explains that Trump reversed his stance from opposing Obamacare to taking credit for protections for pre-existing conditions, one of its core policies, and claimed that Democrats were trying to take it away. Che concludes that he shifted because the protections for this legislation were popular and the attacks on this position were potent. This was effective as at the same time, Jones 20 found that Trump's approval rating rose to its highest point since he took office. Thus, he would take credit for Medicare for All, targeting support from Biden's key swing voters. Additionally, because the policy passes a Republican Senate, it would undoubtedly be associated with his administration. Sack this by taking a voting issue. KFF 20 finds that healthcare is a top voting issue from Democrat and swing voters. The enactment of Medicare for All would disincentivize voters from turning out, tipping the scales in favor of Trump. Indeed, Dotman 20 writes that passing M4A results a golden ticket for Trump that could bury the left for a generation. The impact is climate change. Joe Saw 19 writes that a second term would overlap with the shrinking window to reverse climate change, including that Trump's re-election would lock in drastic rollbacks in environmental regulations. Additionally, it would ensource major polluters such as China and India to walk away from their own climate commitments. This would be catastrophic because Profeta 18 finds that preventing just a 0.5 degree rise in Celsius would save 153 million lives. Luckily, Biden plans on tightening environmental regulations to prevent such a rise in temperature. Our second contention is the global impact. Taxes won't be enough to fund Medicare for all as George 19 estimates that it would cost over $32 trillion. Indeed, Shapiro 20 explains that doubling all corporate taxes and increasing taxes for rich Americans by 50% would only cover 23% of annual costs. This has two consequences. The first is foreign aid cuts. Lancaster 07 writes that a foreign aid is seen as trading off with domestic priorities like healthcare spending. The public pushes for cutting aid. Nasio 17 finds that when forced to cut spending, politicians also cut aid first because the harms are not felt by their voter base. Thus, Alan 13 finds that empirically, aid has been the first on the chopping block during tough budgetary times. Cutting aid would be disastrous as U.S. foreign aid helps construct better infrastructure on countries to help their economies grow. Worf 17 finds that the U.S. foreign aid, 54 million people received education and 3 billion people received food. The government also delivered medications would save 740 million lives. Second is a debt disaster. As aid represents only 1% of the cost of Medicare for All, O'Connor 20 explains that affirming would still increase the national debt by $1.4 trillion a year, more than doubling our current deficit. The U.S. borrows money by selling treasury bonds and increases interest rates to attract investors with higher returns. Thus, the Federal Reserve concludes that a 10% increase in the deficit raises the 10-year bond yield rate by up to 4%. As investors shift to more profitable U.S. bonds, investment in emerging economies drops dramatically, and for this reason, Frankel 01 finds that a 1% increase in the interest rate decreases the performance of emerging market equities by 17%. Moreover, high bond demand increases the value of the dollar. As the demand for dollar increases so that investors can buy U.S. bonds and the supply of dollars decreases as the treasury exchanges those dollars for bonds. This explodes the debt of emerging markets. Barnstein 18 finds that over two-thirds of their debt is dollar-denominated, meaning that countries have to convert from their own weak local currencies to pay off their debt. When the dollar's value increases, each dollar becomes harder to obtain on the debt burden on emerging economies surges overnight. For example, when the dollar's value spiked in 2018, Shapiro finds that the values of Turkey's dollar-denominated debt grew to twice the size of their total foreign reserves. He concludes that countries like Argentina, Mexico, Chile, and Indonesia are vulnerable to the same effect due to their high levels of dollar-denominated debt. Unable to finance, these countries are forced to cut domestic spending. As Navarro 18 concludes that every 10% increase in U.S. interest rates leads to an 8% GDP decrease in these countries. Indeed, when U.S. interest rates hiked in the 1980s, Druden 13 explains that austerity measures in the rest of the world pushed 125 million people into extreme poverty and wiped out a decade of global development. Thus, we gave. I'm ready for cross whenever you are. Also, sorry that I forgot to mute myself during um your speech. That was kind of embarrassing. No worries. All right, yeah, I'm ready. And then, oh, uh, just to make sure, did you send uh, the cards? Oh, yep, send it right now. My That's bad. Okay, um, I just sent it. Uh, we can start cross when you get it, or we can start cross now. Up to you. Uh, we can probably just start cross now. For now, it's, well, I'm fine. All right. Uh, could I take the first question? Sure. Why is Biden's plan worse than what Trump's doing right now? Or why is Biden's Sorry, plan? Biden's plan is worse. Biden's plan is better. My bad. Oh, Biden's plan is better. Um, because first, for example, um. 
I think we are, we already had this question before. But first, um, he would rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, which we would say is probably one of the only plans, um, like multilaterally, would try and reduce emissions. And secondly, the reason why Trump's climate policy is especially so bad is because um, he controls the EPA through the executive branch, and he has uh, rolled back a lot of uh, different legislation designed to prevent pollution. And our evidence indicates that Biden would roll back those rollbacks, so reinstate greater protections for the environment. So can I ask you a question? Okay, yeah. so on your first contention about access, uh, you simply tell me that doctors spend nine hours on billing in the status quo. So let's say you get rid of those nine hours as total. What proves to me that they would be able to see more patients? Okay, so that is the uh, Nueva card that we read in case, which, sorry for the text messages noise, but the Nueva card we read in case says that when doctors don't have to do as much billing and administration, they can actually spend time and do way more uh, help way more patients, which in turn gets them probably more money. Does that so make sort sense? of sounds to me like, oh, okay, go ahead. Does that, that answer, that answers your question, right? Oh, no, but it's, it sort of seems to me like um, what, the, what you were talking about, as in the ridiculous amounts of administrative costs, that seems to be taken on as like, over time, it's like extra work that doctors should not be expected to do. So even if you remove that administrative cost, like what makes it so sure that they still have enough time to see more patients if they weren't supposed to be doing admin cost anyways. Uh, first, we said that doctors have to do administrative administrative work because when they like see a patient, they have to like do a little bit of paperwork on like what they did to the patient. So like therefore, under Medicare for all, you don't have to like deal with each private insurance agency, which is what the uh, Paris 18 evidence says. Can I have a question? Sure. How are you so sure that just in the US, Biden would stop climate change? Or how are you so sure that Biden would stop climate change? Like, um, not just in the US. Oh, well, we are sure because, um, well, I mean, it's it's sort of like a risk of solvency argument. You know, he has a lot of plans to rejoin the Players Climate Court. And even on top of that, um, what this article from Brookings that we might read tells us is that in order for the United States to rejoin Paris Climate Accord, they probably have to make even more stringent promises than before. And right, countries like China and India also look to us for influence about climate policies, which is why, for example, the, um, the Josal evidence says that uh, Trump pulling away has encouraged China and India to go, hey, why isn't the United States following climate policies? We're not going to be a part of this either, which is why all the multilateral initiatives are failing right now. Perfect. That's cross. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a super, super brief weighing, which you can probably just flow at the bottom of our case and then down their case. Okay. Let me open my, actually, let me rearrange my screen. Wait, can you repeat what you just said? Yes, yeah, so super brief weighing, which can probably just flow best at the bottom, like below our case. And then straight down. Okay. Starting on Wang, our argument about immigrants comes first because undocumented immigrants are generally more dire situations and are disadvantaged according to the sum evidence in case meaning that we are way on severity. We should probably prioritize those in the worst scenarios as opposed to prioritizing everyone. At that point, you can go to the case. On elections, at the top, uh, maybe the shell evidence indicates that Medicare for all support is high. That's not talking, that's not, that's just talking about like Republican support specifically. It's not talking about overall support uh, like nationwide. We'd say that you can turn the argument against them because at no point in time has Trump campaigned for Medicare for all, so it would be hard for him to claim it as a victory. With Stika 19 report, that campaign officials say that socialism issues resonate deeply with Trump's conservative base. One of his best avenues for re-election is painting Democrats as out-of-touch radicals by coming out in favor of the democratic policies. We'd say that Trump loses the core of his base because he loses his core ideas. It's too big of a switch and too short of a period of time on uh, to like change his opinion on Medicare for all. This acts as a term because we'd say that Trump's base is probably more important to him winning than him like trying to win over some swing state votings by like adjusting his voting issues. But secondly, you can turn the arguments again. If we prove that Medicare for all works efficiently, then if anything, politics moves forward leftwards, like more leftwards because people like Sanders look like they were new, knew what they were doing all along. But thirdly, 
Turn it again, swing states think Medicare for all is a bad idea specifically. Henning 2019 explains that in key swing states, 62% of voters said a national health plan was not a good idea. These swing states matter most because that's where the election is actually being decided. We'd say that, that like, if anything, Medicare for all makes Trump look uh, like more likely to win. Uh, but then fourthly, Biden, like on the whole idea of like the health care debate, Biden already has Biden care going for him. So he's not going to be able to like lose the health care plate like they argue. On the impact for responses, one, we'd say that if Trump doesn't win in 2020, he's probably going to, uh, like a demo, if Trump wins in 2020, a Democrat is probably going to win in 2024, or at worst 2028, make them prove how many deaths specifically come from like a four year delay in climate policy. But two, the arguments non unique, Carrington 19 reports that we've already lost control of the Earth's climate. There's no bringing that back. But thirdly, like the terminal impact comes from the provider evidence, which is like the zooms, is, uh, I can't remember, like I think a 0.15. Uh, decrease point like percent decrease in emissions at no point do they prove that they link into this so like they don't reach the impact but fourthly we'd say we have a probability no one can guarantee who wins elections like at 2016 it was like 90 10 clinton and trump still won uh like the probability is inherently low for that reason we'd say access is probably more probable go to the arguments about aid on on aid cuts one, Samuels 19 explains that cutting aid is basically impossible. Proposals to cut foreign aid was taken off the table and pushed back from Congress. Co uh, Congress constitutional power of the post was acknowledged in a bipartisan way. The power of the post means that uh, it means that like aid's not going to be cut. But either way, we'd say you can turn the argument against them because aid's bad. Queen 14 reports that humanitarian aid is often physically transported over long distances through territories weakly controlled by the recipient governments. 80% of, of aid can be stolen by armed groups. We'd see that prolongs conflict. Narang 14 terminalizes that a one unit increase in aid is associated with an 11.1% drop in likelihood of war terminating. We'd say that the long-term conflict outweighs these short-term benefits because more people are affected in the long term. Uh, at that point, you can go to the arguments about debt. Firstly, turn the argument, the US accumulates $3.5 trillion of medical debt every year that goes away into Medicare for all. Rudy 19 terminalizes that 8 million people would not be poor if they did not have to pay for medical expenses in America. Medicare for all would reduce headcount poverty by 19% because of that. But secondly, on the crowding argument, like crowded argument specifically for responses, A, China's buying massive amounts of debt at low rates right now if our debt continues to go up they're probably just going to buy more they're really desperate to do it which is why they're buying it at low rates but b the federal reserve can buy debt if like the economy is genuinely being hurt and developing nations are struggling that's what happened in 2008 and it works pretty well but c the crowded effect of winter curve because fundamentally stock market and bond market investors are different and won't switch over uh maverick 19 reports that equity market investors are typically more interested in capital appreciation and pursue more aggressive strategies than fixed income market investors but d investors aren't even care about us debt that much given our bonds aren't even triple a rated anymore they probably buy bonds from someone else, which makes the argument non unique. But three, but then thirdly, in order to prove that crowd it happens, they have to prove that interest on debt goes up. That wouldn't happen because empirically, with more debt, Tammy 17 reports that US debt added up to 900 billion in 1980, but the number now comes down to 20 trillion. Borrowing costs haven't risen. Investors figure that future debt servicing will be easy. The speculation is that we're on the verge of a productivity boom thanks to automation. The implication is that if debt rates stay low because investors think automation is going to happen, uh, investors are no longer going to want to switch over to buying bonds instead of investing in, in developing markets because they're not going to make any more money that way. But then on the dollars impact, there's no warrant as to why debt means more spending. I like spending cuts. OK. Um, I guess we're going to run some prep. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll call you. Oh, can you send the um, sorry, sorry. Did you send the responses for just on the second link about debt? Yeah. All right, thank you. Also, you cut out for me. Could you just send any responses you had between the um, 62 personal health, like the 62% card that you read about them not agreeing with swing states? And then anything between that and the impact level about climate change? I miss those. Okay, yeah, I'll just send my speech doc and like I can go through and see.
Um, okay. Yeah, uh, Amanda, you just got it. Okay. Um, that, that That's good. So we're going to start running prep. Uh, actually, I'm going to call Amanda first. Okay, uh, we're going to start now. All right, so the order is just going to be frontlining and then down the case. Is everyone good? All right, cool. On our first contention about elections, we'll concede that climate change is not unique, their turns don't mean anything. And then on our second contention on foreign aid, we'll concede that like Congress will never cut foreign aid, which means that in either world, foreign aid still happens, their turns don't matter. On our second link about debt disaster, they give you a few responses. First, they tell you that China will buy the debt and the Fed will buy the debt. You can group this because A, this doesn't mean they can buy all of our debt. It will like double under Medicare for all, that's too much. And B, investment will still shift over from the developing world because our interest rates are higher and our bonds are more profitable. And C, even if they win that like interest rates don't increase, demand for bonds is Still like really really high and this means that um the the value of the dollar increases and the debt burden on other nations increases so they still won't be able to finance their debt and their fourth response their third response is that stock and bond investors are different however we're not impacting to like private investment we're impacting to investment in like the u.s and in developing countries it's different and fourth they tell you that investors don't care about like u.s bond rates um however and like uh, that interest rates don't increase. However, like you prefer evidence straight from the Federal Reserve, which tells you that when the deficit increases, interest rates increase as well. We also give you historical precedent. In the 1980s, our interest rates spiked because of the debt. And that's why 125 million people went into poverty. This also answers their sixth response about how there's no warranting. When we give you warranting, when countries can't finance their debt, they impose austerity measures and cut social spending. Let's talk about their case. We agree with the observation, it's fine. Let's talk about their first contention about access. Access actually decreases in their world because Newman Nineteen finds that Medicare for all would slash doctors wages by 40%. As a result, future medical students will no longer see an incentive to become doctors, which would cause a 44,000 doctor shortage. This outweighs their link of paperwork on magnitude. Money is a larger driving force than time spent on paperwork because it more directly impacts a doctor's quality of life. It also outweighs on probability because it's imperfectly proven. In the UK, doctors make half the salaries of their US counterparts, which has led to a doctor shortage. And as a direct result, the UK has had to cancel 9 million appointments in just one year, prefer this over their evidence, which is literally a Medicare for all lobbying group. This serves as a prerequisite to access. There's, it doesn't matter if you have increased health care if there's no one to treat you. Second reason why like access goes down, Lajos tells you that Medicare only reimburses hospitals 87% of the total cost of treatment, causing hospitals to become unprofitable. Thus, Alice 20 writes that nearly half of all hospitals could close. They say that like global budget solves back, it doesn't because it'll still likely be estimated based on current reimbursement rates or like reimbursement rates under Medicare for all, which means that hospitals on that will become unprofitable. This is also a prerequisite to access. It doesn't matter if you have increased health insurance, if you don't have increased health care. 
few more responses. For, uh, uh, third, telemedicine solves back. Jayla told you that health medicine is expanding in this quote, which means that like doctors and hospitals can see more patients even more effectively now. So their impact is like super marginal. And then um, also back on doctors, like most doctors have assistance to file paperwork, especially with insurance filings. And the reason why is that if they can see more patients and they can make more money, which allows them to take burdens off themselves. This means regardless, the doctors with the most patients and the greatest impact aren't affected. And fifth, like most primary care physicians limit the number of different insurance procedures they can accept. This is different than hospitals, which are legally required to treat everyone who comes in, which means that primary care doctors already have streamlined workflows. They're not that burdened by paperwork. Let's talk about their impact. First of all, when you eliminate like it, private insurance, this is actually really bad. If Carr tells you that if the government can wipe out an entire industry, like hospital stocks, drug company stocks, all of that will disappear and cause a recession, the same, uh, about the same magnitude of what happened between the Great Recession and the Great Recession. Amad Amadeo 20 writes that the next stock market crash to kickstart a recession slow global growth and the IMF writes, it gets spilled over to the rest of the world and push 900 million people into poverty. We are way on scope because we affect everyone. And on immigration, first of all, we'll link into their severity weighing because like lower income countries that we affect also have the same levels of se like severity. And um, yeah, and secondly, on immigration, they don't access this impact either. Archer tells you that when Medicare for all is reinforced, it'll force the US to have a uniform electronic health record system, which would enable ICE because Funk19 tells you that ICE piggybacks off of like federal software systems and they would have like access to data about all of these undocumented immigrants. Hoffman tells you that even the fear of ICE accessing their data means that undocumented immigrants delay care until illnesses become critical, causing chronic illness and even disability. Their world makes it worse for undocumented immigrants. Ready for cross? Before yeah. cross, or before cross, can we see the wages turn, the uh, telemarketing turn? Oh, uh, was wages just doctors? Yeah, that's just doctors. Wait, and then can I see the the last? I'm gonna be honest. I'm calling for them because I don't understand them. The last two responses before the stock market crash thing. Uh, Something before about the like crash? care means it's streamlined anyways. Oh yeah, it, sure. Uh, wait, Tobin, what was the second piece of evidence you called for? Uh, the second one was the, I think it's like telemedicine. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, and sorry about this. Could I, also, could I also see the reimbursement evidence? The hospitals? Yeah, specifically the one that says they'll be reimbursed less. Okay. Um, it's in the same card as the doctor's one. I just sent all of them. Okay. Um, you're good for cross. Yeah, whatever you have for his question. So if interest rates don't increase, then how does the dollar become, then how does inflation occur with the dollar? 
Okay, so first we're saying that interest rates probably will increase because that's what happened in the past. But even so, if your argument is that like bond demand is really high right now, that also means that like if we're just pushing more bonds onto the market, more people are buying U.S. bonds, the value of the dollar thus increases because more people are like buying U.S. currency to pay for those bonds. If there's more demand for the dollar, the value of the dollar increases. And all of these countries that have like dollar denominated debt sees like their debt burden suddenly like increase as well. Yeah, sure. Do you want a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if we prove that like, oh, that doctors are going to be leaving the workforce under Medicare for all, doesn't that mean like, it doesn't matter if like healthcare increases since there's less doctors to treat you? No, because, okay, so we'd say a couple things. One, you're probably not going to prove that. Uh, like, the reason why is because we'd say that, um, like, if you have less administrative work to do, that means you have more time to like actually work as a doctor and as a result, make more money on that, which is what the Narayan evidence indicates. But we'd also say that even if there's like a small increase in doctor shortage, it's better that there's a small, like a small increase in wait times for everyone than a massive increase for a big portion of the population, which is what's happening in the status quo according to the Galvani evidence. Wait, let's break that down, right? If I'm a doctor, like, do I care more about making 40% less? That's literally like half of my income being slashed. Or do I care about like filling out maybe two less yeah. forms per patient? No, so, okay. So it's not two less forms, that's nine hours of paperwork, but we're also like, we're linking when you have less paperwork to do you're making more money on net because you spend more time working as a doctor wait do doctors like have assistance for that kind of thing like are doctors just doing nine hours paperwork per day like yeah. every single day no once like nine hours a week is what I'm oh yeah okay sorry nine hours a day is like how much they work every day um right. can i have a question i guess yeah, sure, go for it. Um, your evidence on ICE, does it indicate that ICE is going to have access to the records that are going to be used for Medicare for All? Yeah, it basically says, okay, it's, so it's two pieces of evidence. First, our Archer card tells you that Medicare for All would like create a centralized system. It has everyone's info. And then the second one is that like ICE is really good at piggybacking off of like federal systems such as this one, which means we'll be able to like suck up information and essentially like... Um, target undocumented immigrants. But it goes one step further too, because like even like the fear of having ICE like see your papers, that's what's preventing these undocumented immigrants from accessing healthcare under world with Medicare for all. Yeah, we'd say the fear argument doesn't apply because if people aren't getting sent out of hospitals and there's no fear, but we'd also say that your evidence doesn't indicate that ICE is gonna have access to the record specifically. It just says that ICE is good at like using data, which is a big- Yeah, they're very great at using data. Can we go back like, what were you saying about there's no fear? What was your- what oh, our argument is that like if people aren't being sent out of hospitals and being deported in hospitals, then there's not going to be any fear because there's no like no one's hearing the stories about people being sent out. Wait, that's because Medicare for all hasn't been passed yet, but that's time. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. I will use prep. You know, ice card specifically for Amrit, you know what it says. Um, yeah, it's on the ice card actually. There's a good chance I already have it because I'm pretty sure I called for this last time we debated, but. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you do, but I'll send it anyways. Okay. It's sent by the way. All right, sounds good. Uh, we'll use prep when we see it and mic up, start calling.
Okay. So it's going to go our case, the weighing debate, in their case. It's going to start on this prereq argument that I make. Actually, never mind. It's, it's just going to, our case, the, the first thing I said, our case, the way I need to pay their case. Start on access. What Galvani tells you is that 37 million individuals currently don't have access to cut care. Cliff and Scott says they're really, really bad because really uh, under Medicare for all, we actually provide good care, which is really, really good, which Galvani says uh, increases 73 million life years anyway. On our immigrants impact specifically, Samra says that 11.3 a million undocumented immigrants don't have care. Adrika says that they don't uh, they don't actually have insurance overall. And Samra says that undocumented rates, uh, undocumented uh, people are like, have really high rates of structural vulnerability and not like really, really in a good place right now. And thankfully Medicare for all gives care for everyone and Will for 19 says the uninsured are way less likely to die. Let's go to their responses. First on this prereq, we said the prereq goes the other way. It doesn't matter if you have access uh, if there's no hospitals or anything like that, or if, if you have access and there's no hospitals near you, it's like the prereqs basically a wash at this point. It doesn't matter. On their first response about wages, they completely concede the new wave of evidence, which is that doctors actually make more money because they don't have to do all this paperwork, which is really, really important because when doctors make more money, they're actually not going to, they're going to be more tempted to join the field overall. On their second response about how hospitals are reimbursement rate, call for the evidence is not very good. But second, we'd say that the Kai and Khan evidence takes this out completely because we'd say global budgeting happens and uh, reimbursement happens. So there's overall like you're going to get reimbursed more in total on their third turn about how uh, telehealth care solves back. First, there's no warrant. I don't know what health, telehealth care is. Second, it's like probably worse overall because you're not getting care like at a doctor. Uh, a third, it's like the evidence is from 2018. People still like need insurance and telehealth care costs a lot of money. I don't really know how they go for this. Uh, I don't really know what this argument means. On their fifth response about... um how uh, privatized care happens. First, it doesn't matter, uh, doctors, or this doctor's argument. First, it doesn't matter because doctors still have to do nine hours of paperwork on average. Just because one or two doctors might have an assist assistance doesn't mean that they all have assistance. They still have to do a lot of paperwork. On this uh, recession argument that make they make, one, we're in a recession now. Two, they don't prove that uh, medical debt on net will like, uh, like bring the economy down all the way like down on immigration specifically. They like read this Archer 20 turn, which says that like will enable ICE to like, get data. First, their evidence says like ICE can access data, not that they're specifically going to be accessed to metal, medical data, but second we'd say it's probably just going to be medical data. It's not going to be like really, really personal information about like where you live and all that stuff. That's pretty absurd. On their argument about, or let's go to the Wang debate first. Remember that the Wang that Graham does, which is that we prefer uh, undocumented individuals because they're the uh, most uh, severely hurt right now and we need to help them to get out of a dire situation. Additionally, a second weighing mechanism we could do is death over poverty because they don't read a terminal impact on their case. You always want to prefer uh, putting people in death over poverty because you can get out of poverty, you can't get out of death. On their uh, contention argument about debt. First, extend the TAMI evidence, which is that because of automation, we're actually going to be selling bonds at really, really low rates. And because of the automation booms that's happening, uh, we're not going to make it we're going to make money by doing so. This can, goes completely conceded in the round as terminal defense on their case. But second, we say that people want to buy bonds at low, uh, don't want to buy U.S. bonds anyways, because they're not double A rated, triple A rated anymore. They're probably not very bad. Additionally, they literally do not prove by more debt means that developing nations will cut in spending. Their impact doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, we have a minute and a half left. We're going to start running that now. Hello. Uh, it's going to start on our argument about the debt. Uh, then it's going to address um, uh, it'll, it'll just start in our case.
Okay, is everyone ready? We will concede the Tamni evidence that says automation boom means that bond demand is non-unique. This does not mean that we do not have an impact. It simply means we're going for a second link about dollar-denominated debt. Our O'Connor evidence tells us that taxes won't be enough to fund Medicare for all. We'll have to add $1.4 trillion to the debt. Our, our evidence indicates that the way the Treasury has to fund the debt is by increasing bonds. Now, they have conceded that bond demand is non-unique, which is when, when we pass Medicare for all, the Treasury is going to sell more bonds and people are going to buy them. This hurts emerging economies for two reasons. The first is that the dollar's value increases, A, because supply the supply goes down because the treasury is taking dollars out of the market to sell bonds. And secondly, the demand increases because as they have conceded, people want to buy United States bonds. This is really, really critical because the Barnstein evidence tells us that two thirds of emerging economies debt is literally dollar denominated and that debt explodes. For example, in Turkey, we saw when the dollar's value spiked in 2018, we saw the value of their debt literally doubled to their foreign reserves. And this is what happened to Argentina, Mexico, Chile, Indonesia, and more. The Jordan evidence is also conceded. It tells us that when this happens and people cannot pay for social spending, it literally pushed 125 million million people into poverty. This outweighs for two reasons. The first is that they say, oh, you have to uh, you have to wait. You prefer immigrants because they have uh, like a really severe situations. The reason why it's so severe is they have no access to social safety net. So if we are impacting social safety cuts and cuts to global development in these countries, we are accessing the same level of magnitude weighing only on a much greater scope because they're impacting 11 million people. Our impact is 10 times larger. But let's go on to their case. And even on top of it, they say that death outweighs poverty. That's clearly not true. Like poverty literally causes death, especially in the absence of social safety programs. Their literal impact is that without insurance, without social safety nets, your mortality rate increases. So yes, we definitely do have a terminal impact to death and it's much, much larger than theirs. Let's go to their case. The first really, really big problem is that they don't make a lot of good responses to our dissat about the recession. They simply tell you we're in a recession, the status quo, that is not responsive to our argument. Any adverse economic shocks now can still push more people into poverty. Then they tell you our argument is about medical debt. No, it is not. It's about the elimination of the private healthcare industry. Let's extend it. Our card evidence tells us if you eliminate an entire industry, you literally cause stocks to crash because returns literally come to zero, which is why our Amadeo evidence tells us this destroys economic growth, which is really, really bad because when one industry collapses, a lot of people lose their money, which collapses other industries, spill over. This is why the IMF tells us that adverse economic shocks literally push 900 million people to poverty. And A independently outweighs their case, probably, uh, yeah, and A probably uh, independently outweighs their case on magnitude because we are impacting more quality of life things than just healthcare. And B, it definitely outweighs in scope because it's 10 million versus 900 million. Um, let's uh, go into the impact. Their impact, they do not respond to the Hoffman evidence that says simply the fear of ICE being able to get data pushes immigrants away from healthcare. This is terminal defense against their argument because even if they get an argument into access, that it doesn't mean that immigrants are going to access it because they literally have the fear of ICE. This is really, really critical because yes, they may win the link into access, but they do not win the link that immigrants are going to access healthcare because of course, they're very scared of deportation. And also the incentive weighing is really clear. Yes, you may get access to insurance, you may get access to an appointment, but if that comes at the cost of you getting deported, Obviously, immigrants are not going to take the chance. You cannot vote on the AF. Okay, ready for cross? Yeah. Yeah, whenever y'all take the first question. Okay. We like the 125 million number in summary. What's that referring to? Uh, basically, it's referring to this big debt crisis in the 1980s. Yeah. Wait, where? Like, in um, started in Latin America, it spilled over across the world. It was because, like, you know, that increased. Okay. It was because people couldn't, it's because people couldn't finance their, because, uh, like, countries in this region couldn't finance their debt. Okay, that's fine. You got a question? Uh, sure. Um, so... Actually, Amanda, do you have a question? All right, okay. So... All right, so um, does it matter if like immigrants can access healthcare if they're just afraid of using it for fear of being deported? No, one, I'm 99% sure you don't extend this fear argument in summary, but we'd also say that like Tobin's argument still responds to this and that he says that one, like your evidence literally verbatim just says that ICE is good at using data records. The, like the, that doesn't prove that they're gonna be able to use the Medicare for all like data records, but also those records don't just like say the location yeah. of envy and documented immigrant like that's ever. Not our... Wait, hold See, on. I, I appreciate that, but that's not our argument. Like the evidence we extend is not that ICE would be able to access it. Their argument is the Hoffman evidence, which tells us the fear of ICE being able to access it is what drives immigrants away from healthcare. So it's like a perception yeah. argument rather than, for example, oh, ICE probably won't have access to this database in the yeah. first place. But this not, okay, 
there's not going to be a lot of fear, is there? If everyone recognizes that there's not, um... there is fear already. Like Wait, hang on, that's hang why on. everyone is super afraid of. Yeah. That's why, for example, um, immigrants are really afraid of taking advantage of welfare. But why is a there lot fear? Of Wait, so the, the argument fear comes because the, they've heard of other people being like arrested by ICE, right? No, the fear is they that you give, your, if you give your personal information to the government, it can be used against you. Is there a question? I think we were all speaking at once. So I didn't really hear what anyone said. Oh, yeah. Hey. Okay. Um, so I haven't really been timing, so I'm not, I'm not sure yeah. how much time. We have a minute left. Yeah, we have a minute. All right, y'all okay. can take a question. Sure. So on... Um, Actually, Tobin, do you have a question? Yeah, so on this recession argument you make, you said that you don't, uh, we don't end up proving why the medical industry collapse. Uh... Uh, no, it's that, it's that our argument is not about like people's medical debt, like personal medical debt. To be honest, I phrased this really, really poorly in summary. I was trying to go for a medical industry, my bad. Oh, medical industry. Okay. Well, we think it's just um, like the private insurance industry collapses. And there are also a lot of, you know, investor panic as to whether, um, you know, for example, profits would be affected, or for example, they'd have to do layoffs, or even if like these are, even if your arguments about access are true, there are a lot of big concerns that people have with Medicare for all about like their ability to make money in the future, particularly with the insurance industry, but also, you know, extending outwards. That's gross. Okay. Okay. So it's going to be access weighing and then no case okay time starts now on access the galvani evidence indicates that 37 million people don't have health insurance right now that's that's i thought it's got experience that medicare for all provides health insurance to all of them which is why the the welfare evidence indicates that when you when you gain your insurance when you gain uh, insurance well, your mortality rate decreases by uh, 40 percent that applies to immigrants and not immigrants meaning that we're like solving we're, we're helping everyone out uh, they go for a couple of responses. The one is this argument about recession. Uh, Tobin's response is pretty clear in summary that we're already in the recession, that the 900 million people are already like are, are, has already been triggered. The people who are vulnerable to being pushed into poverty because of the recession have already been pushed into the uh, pushed into poverty. Like it's totally non-unique. But also, this doesn't respond to, like the warranting in our case, so it doesn't really matter. Then they go for this ice turn about how um, about like um. ICE deporting people and that being bad, we'd say there's literally no evidence to indicate that ICE gains access to the data for Medicare for all, but there's also uh, no total impact extended as to like what, what it actually means or how many people get deported. Uh, on the weighing, we weigh on two counts. A is, a is that severity of death is more important than poverty. They respond by saying that poverty caused death. Sure, it's slightly correlated, but we'd say that a direct link into death is probably a better link in than like poverty leading to death because you don't know how much poverty causes how much death. But B's probability, like their arguments about like the uh, dollar inflation leading to an increase in debt for developing countries is totally unclear because you don't know how much of an increase in how much inflation happens or how much of that, uh, how much uh, of that increase in inflation leads to how much more debt or how much more like social spending. We even how much of a cut of social spending leads to how much more uh, people going to poverty. The impact analysis like just isn't there. Where it, it is there in our case when we tell you that Medicare for all decreases mortality by 40%. It's pretty clear. But then you can go to their case. Uh, they're probably winning a link about inflation. We'd say that, like they go, there's no total impact on it. They, they go for this thing about 125 million people and being affected by a debt crisis in the 80s. They, one, don't prove this happened because of the increase in debt. So it's like doesn't link into their arguments. But also they don't prove how much of the debt, uh, how much of the debt increase actually goes back into this argument about people being pushed into poverty. Uh, the argument isn't contextualized. You probably don't want to vote for it. OK. Um, I think we have about 30 seconds left. Uh, we're just going to run all of it. Oh, actually, I'm going to call Amanda first. Cool.
great. Uh, let me just get my timer out. Good. And the order is just going to be our case, uh, the equities thing, and the Wang. Or, yeah, I'll, I'll just start on my case and signpost. Is everyone good? Okay. We're very cleanly winning our second link debt disaster. They like concede all of our links, but I'll send them anyways. O'Connor tells you that when you pass Medicare for all, you increase our deficit by like two times. This means that the government sells more bonds. When there's high demand for bonds, this means that the value of the dollar increases. This is really bad for emerging economies because the value of their debt literally surges overnight. This happened empirically in Turkey. We saw their debt double in 2018 when the US debt increased. Um, and Dearden tells you that this happened in the 1980s too. We'll give you really great empirics. So last time developing nations like debt surged, 125 million people were pushed into poverty because these countries had to cut social spending in order to finance their debt. That's a warning we give you. It's really clearly extended throughout this entire round. They give you like some new responses and final focus. First, they say we don't contextualize their impact. It's very contextualized. It's been in every single speech. Like they don't attack this before like final focus. They probably can't respond to it this now. And secondly, they don't like, they say we don't prove how much debt decreases social spending. But literally, if you can't finance the debt, this all of social spending is like slashed, which is why Navarro tells you that um, in the past when like debt has increased, GDP has decreased by a lot. And these nations have slashed social spending. It's empirically happened, pushed 120 25 million people into poverty. The second way we win is on this equity they said on their case. We give you really clean link extensions. CAR tells you that if you eliminate the entirety of the private insurance industry, this means that like medical supply stocks, like drug stocks, private insurance stocks, all are immediately wiped away, which would cause a recession somewhere between the Great Depression and the Great Recession in terms of scale. This is really, really terrible. Amadeo tells you that this would spill over to the rest of the world because global growth would be spilled, would be stopped. And like the IMF tells you this would push 900 million people into poverty. They just say that coronavirus is already hurting our economy right now. However, it's a scalar impact and always get worse. Obviously, this only superchargers our link. If our economy is shaky right now, the last thing we should do is cause like another recession. So at this point, this also outweighs their entire case on scope because it's 900 million people in poverty. Let's talk about the way they keep on extending this thing about how like death is a more direct link into poverty. We're impacting into the same link. They say that their world increases social spending. We say our world decreases like social safety nets. We're both talking about social safety nets. We're just impacting, we link in and we impact on a larger scale because we're impacting like the whole world. They only impact like 11 million people. All right, uh, good round. Good debate. Good round. Good round. It's good.